Welcome back to the Irish Bears Network. For technically, it's our 300th live show, but it's actually our first show uh, as a new name, a new logo. So it is good to be back. It is a very special day for all three of us here. It is both our 300th live show, but also it is our three-year anniversary of the show as well, because I think it was officially like the 31st of March or 1st of April, three years ago, that we decided to do this thing, talking about Andy Dalton. And here we are, 300 episodes later, and you crazy jackpots are still listening to to us. So uh, it is great. Uh, Welcome to the show. And to Tony, anybody that is listening, make sure that you do get in your comments. Make sure if you are looking at us over on Twitter that you head over onto YouTube so you can get your questions in. We have three guests today. We will have Jeff from the Bears blog. We will have Robert Schmidt. And then finishing off the show, we will have Adam Rank. But before we do that, just a little bit of a, an intro into kind of this special episode today. We are just here just to kind of say thank you to everybody that continues to listen to our three gobs every single week because it it does mean (laughs) a lot. But also, there's a big thanks to kind of people that have been on the show in the past. So, like, from all the guests, all you guys in in the comments, some of the fans that we've had on the show over the last three years as well, um, it's been great. But then, obviously, some of our former co-hosts, like, for example... We have Noel, we have Scott, Corey, Adam, and Seth, and a thank you to to those guys. Um, but yeah, look, I guess before I kind of continue on, we do have a co- a little montage with some of our previous guests over the last three years that kind of sent in a little message. So we're going to play that at the beginning of the show today before we invite the the guests on for today's show. But before I do, Antonio, is there anything you guys want to say on this kind of special day for the podcast? Uh, first of all, yeah, it's pretty damn cool. What's what's interesting was I went back and watched the first bit of the first episode, and yeah, we were talking about Andy Dalton, and my God, how far has this episode and this program come from, and how far has the has the Chicago Bears come in that time? So to go from Andy Dalton QB one, I think was our first conversation, uh, talking about that that whole episode that was there. So yeah, look, it's been fantastic for everyone to get involved. It's been brilliant for everyone that's been here. So it's just pretty class. 300 live episodes man that is hugely impressive and the most impressive thing about it is the fact that there's so many hours of footage on youtube of my dull inane drivel <laughs> everyone sat and listened to which i find i find fucking remarkable so thanks very much for that guys i really do appreciate it but yes yeah, same as what the guy said it's been great having um, you know, working alongside you guys and, and the other guys that have been on hosting before. We've had some mental guests on over the years um, between, you know, folk that are on networks and sports people and fans and the people who listen to the show and players, and it's been crazy. Um, so, yeah, I've made a lot of good friends through this, and the first three years have been phenomenal. So hopefully the next three years can I go even bigger heights than that but uh but yeah i mean we'll see some of some of the uh the the guests shortly that we've had on before that are going to be joining us live today Uh, and those guys were selected based on the fact that they were some of some of the kind of favorite guys that we have had on over over the years and who have made a significant impact to our show in many different ways yeah so without further ado i will play that video it's about kind of two to three minutes long and then we will introduce our first guest onto the program so I guess, sit back and enjoy. Congratulations, Irish Bears Show. On behalf of Alf and all of us at the Bears blog, 300 episodes is nothing to sneeze at. Keep it going. That's amazing. And you guys provide great content, not just for Irish Bears fans, but for Bears fans all around the world. Keep up the great work. The world, Chicago. Congratulations on the show. 300 episodes, bored out of the chaos of COVID, going strong, kicking ass. Cannot wait to see what's next. And as always, thanks for having me on. 
you guys on your uh, 300th episode, man. That's that's insane that I was one of your first guests, and just to see how far you guys have come has been absolutely amazing. So, congrats on all the success. Uh, look forward to seeing what's in the future, and uh, hope you guys have me on again soon. Congratulations on 300 episodes. What an incredible milestone. You know, uh, I will always have your podcast, uh, a special place in my heart for your podcast, because y'all were actually the very first show to invite me on to talk. I thought that was really cool. I really appreciated that. Um, so I'll, I'll always, like I said, I'll always have a special place for your, here's to 300. Congrats on 300 live shows. Uh, you guys rock. And here's 300 more. On episode 300, the international following of this team is incredible. You guys are the best. Congrats. At the Irish Bears show, they just reached an awesome milestone. 300 live shows. It's an amazing accomplishment. Keep up the great work, and I cannot wait to see what you guys do moving forward. Episodes amazing. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this growth of the Irish Bears show. It has been awesome to see you guys do what you do. Can't wait for the next 300. Congratulations on 300 live shows. You guys do incredible work providing Bears fans with the best Bears content out there. You have it always covered from top to bottom. I was honored to be part of one of your 300 shows. Here's to 300 plus more. Wishing you guys all the best. And thanks again for including me. And congratulations on such a major achievement. Good. Oh, hey. I'm just looking for something to toast my friends at the Irish Bears Show podcast. I cannot believe you guys have done this many episodes already. Wasn't it just a few years ago that I was sitting in a football stadium doing your show as a guest while I was waiting for my daughter during cheerleading? And now look at you guys. Look at how small our worlds have come together just from a Bears podcast. I love it. Congratulations. I think I found what I want to toast you with. Irish gunpowder gin. <laughs> I, li I like the end of that one there, but look, Without further ado, first, I, I guess just a big thank you to all those people that have been on. Obviously, there's been so much more, 300 shows. There's so many people that we can thank. But our first guest we've had on a, a couple of times here, and it's always a pleasure to have him on the show. And it is Jeff. Um, one second here. <laughs> He's nearly there. Tell and... me, tell me she, tell me she mixes the gunpowder gym with something. <laughs> <laughs> and that poor, poor Peggy Kaczynski's not shot to shit right now on Jim. <laughs> all right. Yes, all right, just, Jeff, just, move on. Hold on. On that note, I was going to drink the Malort on the show. I'm not. We do have a little bit of your old nectar, the JMO whiskey here. So what we're going to do is on air, I don't know, if, is this illegal still? It used to be illegal on television. We're going to pour oh, no. ourselves a little... Champagne goblet of uh, I gotta open the beer because I'm so a weak. I'm gonna take a shot on air to you boys for 300 episodes. Let's get pissed. Cheers, man. <laughs> Cheers, chef. Can I just say I've never seen anybody drink a Jameson's out of a, out of a champagne flute before. That's, because, that's how you celebrate, my friend. That's how you celebrate. <laughs> I, it's actually, I think it's better in the champagne flute, to be honest. I like that. It's, cla it's I might classy. Have, I, might have, I might have another one. It's pure uh, class there, Jeff. Pure class. Just a note to your listeners. I tried to make a hot toddy when I was sick with Malort, and I want to make sure everyone knows, do not do that. Hot Malort <laughs> is the most disgusting thing you've ever tasted in your life. I think it made me three to four days sicker. So <laughs> stay away from hot Malort. Hot toddy should be whiskey, not Malort. <laughs> It, it's it's a tried and tested method. The old uh, hot toddy man. I, I can definitely vouch for him, man. It definitely it definitely works. Listen, Jeff. First, first and foremost, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to, to have you on. Uh, obviously, you know you've been on a few things before. You've been one of our kind of uh, guys that have really done a lot for our show, um, and obviously we really appreciate that. So we definitely wanted to have you on for our three hundredth episode, um, and and uh, obviously. You know, catch up, see what's been happening. Obviously, you were on the show for the first time, I think, two seasons ago. Um, we've come a long way from when you were breaking the Ryan Pace firing news ah. on the show. 
show. Uh, on the show. We're all the way now here just before the 2024 draft. So the first question, Jeff, looking back from then until now, are the Bears, the organization, the team, the expectations where you thought they would be or are, 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 they, are they lagging behind or, or, or running ahead? Well, let me give you two, two quick things. Number one, your, your listeners and your, your, your followers need to understand when you get into the game that you boys got into 300 episodes ago, it is, it is such a hurdle that people don't understand to commit to the commitment. You have to commit to producing. You have to produce consistently. And you have to be able to almost ignore, in a lot of cases, how many listeners, how many followers. How, you just do the work. And the work ultimately either pays off or it doesn't. And now you guys started in a much more crowded marketplace than I started in. I started with one other entity. You've got 4 million. So <laughs> the fact that you're here 300 episodes later is nothing to sniff at. That's one. Number two, I need to see more creativity out of all those videos. I got Alf. I got Malort. <laughs> I mean, does Adam Hogue, does Adam Hogue have to show off the abs in every fucking video? <laughs> Come on, Adam. We, we get it. You work out a lot. Um, here, here's what I'll say about the Bears right now. I don't know that I've been able to say this with any confidence since Lovey and Jerry. It just feels like it's in good hands right now. And there's a confidence I feel around each decision where I don't feel the need to micromanage micromanage like anybody gives a shit what I think, but micromanage each moment. I don't feel the need to go, let's get crazy about this move or this move or this move because the big picture feels like it's always being considered. And I'll go back to something that I don't know that we've seen before. As Justin Fields is walking off Soldier Field and that crowd is screaming his name, we want Fields, we want Fields, the first comments the general manager made about that moment was, I can't listen to that, right? His first thought was, I have to see the bigger picture. I can't, and, and very obviously, he was moving on from Fields. And I think it's, it, there's a confidence right now, I feel, headed into this season coming up. Not because I believe Caleb Williams is going to bring some superstar to town, and not because I believe they're going to be a Super Bowl team next year. I don't necessarily think that. It's because I think there's a project that I understand. And that project should start really showing the positive sides this year, the year after, the year after that. This we have been living in the one and done year, it feels like, for 15 years since really, since Jay Cutler got to town. It's load up for this year, load up for this year, load up for this year. And it took a GM from a winning organization to come in and say, these guys aren't good enough. We need to lose all of these guys. We need to build from scratch and you need to be able to suck it up for two years while I build this thing back up from the ashes. And it's been boring to some degree. I mean, this offseason has been wild to watch on Twitter. I have stayed out of it as much as I can. But uh, it is exciting to think that this organization is finally in the right hands. But now that has to translate to wins. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not one of these people who's going to say Caleb Williams is going to win 11 games. You want Caleb Williams to play well. If Caleb Williams plays well, and who knows what that means as a rookie, they're going to win games. The roster is good. That roster is good. That roster went I, – I like to do these comparisons that people don't like. I like to say things like, they should have beat the Lions twice last year, and the Lions should have been in the damn Super Bowl. So just think about the league. This league is so tight at the top. There is so little separating the Packers from the Niners and the Niners and the Lions. But there's so little separation in this league that a move or two – can set you on the right path. And I think this team's on the right path. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of confidence uh, in the GM position that we haven't had. Well, I don't remember the last time we had that that confidence. It's been a long, long time. Given given what we've seen polls do then, obviously 2022, 2023, we're now in the third year of us watching him evolve as a GM and building teams and making moves. Do you think we have a better feel for the type of GM he is at this point in terms of knowing what to expect with the types of moves that he's going to make? Or is that still evolving and it's still to sort of reveal itself, given the fact that we're looking at this as a long-term thing? You know, we're talking yeah. about decades. We're not talking about five years. But, you know, are we, have we seen the, 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 you know, the tendencies of Ryan Pace, Ryan Poles rather, 
Um, or is that still to reveal itself, do you think? I think it's starting to reveal itself. I mean, year one was a straightforward teardown. Year two, we saw, I think in year two, this guy's got a talent over the draft weekend. He, he's able to identify talent, especially in those middle rounds. Uh, I think he hit hit a home run with Darnell Wright. I think people are going to see that much more in year two from Darnell Wright. I think the fact that we're hearing them talk about offensive tackle now, uh, possibly in that with that second first round pick, tells me that they're doing the thing I've wanted them to do for the last 42 years of my life, which is stop settling for good enough at premium positions. Stop telling me Braxton Jones can do it. I think he's going to improve. I think he can do it. But if you identify somebody at that ninth pick who you think is a superstar at that position, upgrade. Because you need, in this league, you need five to seven. I'm completely arbitrary numbers. I just made off off the top of my head. Five to seven blue chip guys. (laughs) Right? You need those guys where you go, they have the best player at, at guard, right tackle, middle linebacker, safety. They have those guys. Nobody's winning titles without blue chippers at, at premier spots. And I, unless you have the blue chipper at quarterback, which Kansas City has, which means you can just fuck around and see what happens. The, the thing I want to see from polls now, and it will happen starting at the end of this season, there's no more time. You're gonna you're gonna choose your quarterback, right? You've you you've already gotten into bed with the coach. The people who think the coach is on the hot seat, I do not think he is. Look at the look at the way he's dressing, look at the way his facial hair looks. That guy is not, that guy, that guy is not nervous about his fucking job right now. He is confident, and that's because the, the general manager went to the owner and said, He's my guy. So yeah. this is now gonna be Poles, Fluce, and Caleb Williams. And so I think over the next two years. It's now about can Ryan Poles take an organ? One of the hardest moves in football is going from seven or eight wins to 11 wins, right? From 11 to 13 doesn't really matter anymore, but that's become going from being a team that's relevant to a team that's really good and perennially in the playoffs, very difficult to do. That's where he is now. This Now the moves have to be surgical. They have to be, you've built the team. There's a roster here. It's good. Now you got to be surgical, right? That ninth pick. Uh, and, and we're doing the spaces on Saturday, Schmitz and I, where we're only talking about the ninth pick. And I'm just going to throw him fucking curveballs about trades the whole <laughs> way until we get there. Uh, <laughs> so I have, like seven, I have like seven trades before we get to the ninth pick. This one, I'll have no idea what's going on. The, that ninth pick, I keep looking at it and saying, man, that's the first real pick of the Ryan Poles era because he'll have selected his quarterback. He'll have selected his coach. They've got an offensive structure. They've built the defense. That's the where do you think the Chicago Bears need to go with that pick to put you over the top? Is that a tackle? Is that an edge rusher? Is that a wide receiver? We're all on those three. But maybe he looks somewhere else. Maybe he he says, I want to go back because I want a defensive tackle. Whatever he sees, we're going to learn a lot about him from that pick because that's the first pick I look at where it says, okay, I need this to get into the postseason. This is the position I need. And I'm fascinated to see how he handles it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. It's um, I think that that number nine pick is probably going to be the big tell-all because everyone knows Caleb Williams' number one pick. That's that's done and dusted. And done the interesting January. conversation now, thankfully we're moving on from the quarterback conversation. The interesting conversation now is what do you do at nine? Do you, do you go wide receiver? Do you go pass rusher? Do you go offensive tackle? You know, we will obviously go into a bit, yeah. a bit more of that later. What I wanted to do, though, is talk about some of the moves that he has made already. And I wanted to play a little game here. Uh, oh. Ryan Poe's off-season moves, stick or twist. So uh, I don't know you guys call it 21, blackjack, pontoon, whatever you call it. But basically, I'm going to give you four moves that have been made this season. Jeff, initially, I want you to let me know whether you stick with what Poe's did, agree with, or if you don't, what you would have done instead. And then, okay. you know, and obviously you guys come in uh, as well. Stick or, uh, stick or twist. Is a, that is great. Stick or twist. <laughs> right, so here we go, right? So <laughs> number one. Hey, Johnny, tell them what they win on today's episode of Stick or Twist. <laughs> I should have worn my sparkly game show jacket. Yeah, <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> number one, keep it Matt Eberflus. You touched on it a little bit there. Now, the beard has swayed a lot of people for obvious reasons. But prior to the beard, what what were you thinking at the end of the season? Were you uh, were you on board with keeping Flus? 
or, or, or were you looking to move on? I mean, I just I knew he was keeping him very early in that second half of the season. So there was a, there was a point where I did get all revved up about it. Um, they they very much liked what he did to sort of pull this season out of the fire. And I, and I, I guess they lost some games they shouldn't have lost. There's clearly flaws in the Matt Eberflus system as I see them. But man, they turned that season into something that I did not see possible two or three weeks into the year when coaches are getting raided by the FBI and they're getting blown out on prime time television. And I think there's something to be said for that. Now, I'm a Jim Harbaugh guy for a long time. I think he's a lunatic, but I also think he's a winning football coach. If you were going to bring Jim Harbaugh in, you were not going to keep Ryan Pope. And if people don't understand that, look at who Jim Harbaugh brought in as his GM, his brother's buddy from Baltimore. For two. Nobody's radar. On nobody's radar for a GM because the GM of the Chargers is Jim Harbaugh. And if you're going to hire Jim Harbaugh, it's his program, it's his team. I didn't think the Bears needed to go there. You could have sold me on Vrabel. But again, Vrabel has a bit of that alpha Harbaugh thing. So now, now does Ryan Poles want an equal? Or does Ryan Poles want to run the show with a coach he can trust? I think he wants that. So I will stick with it. I will stick with it. But I, I am also sticking with it because, and maybe this is the next thing, because they got Shane Waldron and because they got an offensive structure to go alongside him. Shane Waldron is an offensive head coach who is used to working with a defensive-minded veteran coach, the perfect hire, and they landed him. That's why I like Ibra Fuzmo. Stick. So, it, and anything from you guys on that one? I, I know we've been critical of Eberflus, but was it the right move? I'll, I, I'll stick because it pisses Ant off. That's the only yeah, reason. Yeah, it <laughs> fucking wrecks my head. It also annoys me that I agree completely with Jeff. He's here for another two years with his fancy beard and his new his new runners and his new look that his wife and kid gave him. Good on you, Matt. Good on you. I call his look the anti Tressman. It is, he looks like a human being. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he wasn't a human being last year when you're putting Justin Jones into coverage. But anyway, next. I will listen, I would have fired, I would, I would, I'm on record. I said it, uh, I think on Twitter, I was loaded. Uh, I would have fired Ibra Fuchs like week four. I mean, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought I was seeing Tressman redo. I thought the thing was crumbling before our eyes. And I'm shocked he was able to pull a season out of that group. But you actually heard a lot of those players, and players tend to be kind of dumb, but what you heard a lot of those players say was, we just stuck with his program, and he never wavered. Now, how do you don't waver when your defensive coordinator and one of your best friends is being raided by the Federal Bureau of Investigation? I don't know. But that's why you grow a beard and you get a little tough about it. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and then one of his first moves uh, this offseason was to bring in Shane Waldron. Obviously, uh, it would have been something in conjunction with Ryan Poles, but uh, offensive coordinator was a big need. We knew there was issues there. Um, you know, partly there was quarterback issues as well, so it's not just one thing. But how, where are you with the Shane Waldron hiring? I think he kind of came out of left field, wasn't expected to be available. Well, that well, once he became available, he was their own, he was their primary target. They talked to everyone. The fact that they got Brown and Waldron because Brown was their second choice, and. Yeah. The thing about, again, I'll say this about Walter, and I, and I don't think people understand. Number one, he got production out of Geno Smith, which nobody else has gotten. He got production out of Drew Locke, even, which no one else has gotten. But Shane, the problem that uh, Getty had, more than even the play calling, was that he just doesn't command a room. And so there was all of this talk in the locker room of, we didn't know who our leader was. We, we, there was nobody to trust. That's over now. Waldron is going to own the offensive side of the ball. And as a matter of fact, he'll have more autonomy than even Getsy had because Poles is now far more involved in the day-to-day. -day. So this is going to be Waldron's offense. He brought most of his staff, a lot of his staff over. And, and Brown is right there. So if Waldron has a great year, this thing Bears fans are afraid of that never happens, where our offensive coordinator has a great year and then he leaves. It's never happened in the history of the organization. But one day it's going to happen and blow people's minds. If Waldron were to have a great year and move on, Brown is sitting right there. And, and he's an offensive coordinator. With, this structure in this offense is so good for a young quarterback. This was the this was the home run of the offseason. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Stick. there's a lot I'm of... I'm sorry, I forgot the game. Stick. Stick. <laughs> <laughs> Tony forgot <laughs> the game. <laughs> We've got two sticks already. Keep on hand. Uh, yeah. Waldron, I, know, I know you guys like him. Yeah, fucking move on. Next question. Uh, 
<laughs> right. Okay. Here's the big one. Okay. So Jeff, I know obviously you, uh, you know, from what I've heard you talking about, you were a fan of moving on from fields. Um, so rather than saying if it was the best move, what I will ask you is the manner in which it was handled, you know, the, the return that we got for him. Um, do you think polls went about it the right way in terms of that player friendly approach? Or would you have rather had the team friendly take the highest bidder and, and just kind of move on as soon as you get the opportunity? Guys, there was no highest bidder. It didn't exist. And anybody you think is telling you that they got second and third round offers and they turned them down is fucking lying to you. The offers didn't exist. Now, if you were ready to move on from him no matter what at the end of this season, I would have been looking to deal him in the middle of this season. That's the only difference. I would have been looking to unload him in the middle of this season to a team maybe like the Jets who were looking for a quarterback that they could use. I I think Justin Fields can be a starting quarterback in this league. I also think he has flaws in his game that are so glaring to me and, and so difficult to overcome. The history of players who are bad pocket passers, who become good pocket passers, is, is a very small list. And do I wish they got more for him? Sure. Do I care where they send him? Not really. Uh, I think they, I, I think I said this, I wasn't on your show at the end of the year. I said this to Schmitz one day. I said, I would not have played him in the Green Bay game. If you were going to trade him, I would have had him walk off that field against Atlanta with that big performance. I would have said, you got a knee injury. Tell his, tell his agent, you're going off on this note because we're going to sell you high this offseason. And I wonder if things change if that's his last game. Probably not. But I'll give you a little story I heard about, about Minnesota. Minnesota loved Fields. But they also love Darnold, which tells you they have no fucking idea what they're doing at quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> when, they were, when, they, when they approached the Bears, they offered what I was told was a fifth-round draft pick. And the Bears waited. But the Bears decided the value was, more, was better to send him outside the division, get him the hell out of town where we don't have to see him. And I, and I get that sentiment. But that was the only team, only team, that wanted to make him a starting quarterback. Every other team interested in Justin Fields was interested in him being a backup that they would grow. So you didn't have a choice. I got Bear the cat behind me if you can not against it. Um, you didn't really have a choice. You had to trade him. It sucks that you didn't get more for him. But I just think we have so drastically overrated him as a player because we're so hungry for success at the position that we thought something was coming that was never coming. So you, you would have hoped they could have gotten more, but I, I'm certainly not surprised they didn't. Stick. All right, last yeah. one, Jeff. Stick. Um, Stick. Free, free agent moves. Now, we we're all coming in to the offseason. We've got a ton of money. We've got this kind of renewed optimism that we're bringing big players in. But for a lot of people, the moves that were made were a wee bit uh, uninspiring, under the radar, not what folk expected. Where are you in the sort of moves and the money that was spent from, from polls this season? Did, did you expect more, or was it sort of a good idea to stick the way did? Twist! Twist. Okay. <laughs> I, I think this team missed one boat, and that to me was Bryce Young. Uh, Bryce Huff, Bryce Huff. Bryce Young, nobody missed. Bryce Huff. <laughs> This team is still bereft a serious second pass rusher. And there was guys on this market who could have at least solved that problem to some degree. Bryce Huff could have solved that problem for multiple years down the line. And I think that's a miss for me in free agency. I'm not – I was seeing some of these numbers for offensive linemen. No way you can spend that kind of money. It makes no sense. What they needed – was wide receiver. The trade for Keenan uh, was great. What they needed was a pass rusher, and they did nothing at that position. Now you're in a place where it's very much looking like the best case scenario for this season is hoping a rookie evolves into an elite pass rusher, which does not often happen as a rookie. I thought you could have used free agency this year to put a guy there who's going to give you 10 sacks, and Bryce Huff would have done that. So that's my twist of all the moves. I would have spent that money I would have taken that chance on a young pass rusher and try to fill all my holes and have a, have, a, have a roster built around a rookie quarterback where I say, we don't have a hole on this roster. And right now they have a definitive hole on this roster. They only have one pass rusher. 
Yeah, I probably agree with you on that. It's um, to be honest with you, I think the most likely move at the moment is if they don't go pass rush early in the draft, they might end up just bringing Yannick and Gakwe back and just running with that and seeing what happens. And as you say, maybe one of these younger guys that they get later on in the draft can sort of step up and and, and sort of get there. So, but that, I'm, I'm glad we eventually got a twist in that. I thought Ryan was. <laughs> <laughs> he's right the whole way through, and I was like, "No, well, Jeff's going to point something out here for that." He's a he's a, he's a different kind of GM in that he doesn't seem to be all that interested in the flashy move. He does, he's, he's not. He he has a plan. He has a structure in place, and if you don't fit in his financial structure, he's not making that move. And the Huff numbers, I'll be honest, the Huff numbers were way higher than I thought they would be. And the Eagles didn't mind because they were shipping Hassan Reddick out of town, and they were trying to ship Josh Sweat out of town. So. They ended up keeping him, but I, I think he said to himself, I don't want to pour this much money into this position right now. I'm going to get my rookie quarterback. I'm going to see what he is. And when I see what he is, I'll then look at next season and go, this is where we take our first shot at it. I'll now fill in whatever holes we have. And, it's, and right now when I look at this roster, the only hole I really see in terms of a, this can cost you wins and losses is that second pass rusher. Uh now, I still think the defense is going to be perfectly fine to win a ton of games, but that's the whole, if you're looking at the roster and saying, what what don't they have? They don't have that second pass rush. Yeah, I, th- I think I think we're far removed from the, the Phil Emery days of spending a ridiculous amount of money on Jared Allen and things like that when they're they're sort of past their prime. Um, so maybe it's a good sign that we're not, we're not overspending for players who maybe aren't producing as much as what they're, uh, probably worth, but Jeff, listen, we're we're uh, we're going to have your uh, the Bears blog uh, partner in crime on the editor show. in the editor in chief. Call him what he is. He's the editor in chief. The editor the in blog. chief. He is. Uh, the, he I, is the I, I really feel like I'm speaking to the fucking president here. Or something like <laughs> <laughs> I call myself the blogger emeritus. I am simply. I am still around campus. I teach a class or two, but it's all ceremonial. Uh, it, listen, it, it's time for the kids to take over. And Robert Schmidt, who never is video without his sunglasses now, which is like, you know, fucking blues brother. There is never <laughs> a time when you see Schmidt without his sunglasses. Uh, I, I will hand over the keys, but I want to say it again. What you guys are doing, and I know you're going to be a network now, which who the fuck knows what that means. We're going to see. <laughs> Irish, Bears, man. Irish, Irish, Irish Bears, Kinsale, Irish Bears, Kinsale, Irish Bears. You got Port it. You Arnold. got it. Yes, we're getting there. Yeah, just get every fucking village. And, and every. I just watched, one other thing. I just watched an entire documentary on Stab City Limerick. And let me tell you something. Oh, my, yeah. next time, my next time over there, I'm staying away from the fucking moose. Oh, I'm bringing oh, bring you. I'm bringing you. I, I, I'm, I'm, not not I'm, I'm not I'm bringing you. You will love it. Limerick is mental. My you favorite bar in Limerick. My favorite bar in Limerick is called Clancy's. My friends' family is leaving. That bar. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you uh, again. I I just hope people don't uh, understand. I hope people understand how hard it is to do what you're doing, and you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, and I'm proud to be even a small part of it. And I think this is going to go on for a long time. And I hope to one day in my retirement be hosting uh, Irish Bears Network Spittle in the Irish village of Galway. Spittle. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll be sitting in this tiny pub speaking, speaking Irish and going, there's it to everybody who walks in. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be it. So congratulations, guys. It's been unbelievable. And uh, I think good times are coming. So I, I think things are going to be on the uptick, but I thought that before and I've been wrong. So don't listen to me. <laughs> Cheers, Jeff. Cheers, Jeff. Take care, guys. Yeah. Hail, hail. All right, so we are going to introduce our, our next guest, which we, we did say it was Robert. Uh, but before we do, there was a couple of very uh, kind uh, people in the chat. So let me just go back to them. One of our good friends, Tanner. So Tanner besides is a put, he, he puts twenty dollars in there saying congratulations on 300 episodes. And I was shocked that he did it. And then the man comes back again with another 10. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. And then one of our other good friends uh, from the Byron Network is Aldo, and he's also done that. So we do appreciate it. Um, again, guys, make sure that you get your, your comments in, get your questions in. And next up onto the stage is Robert Schmidt. Editor in chief, how are you doing? Y'all, we're doing so good. I mean, not to take the words out of your mouth, but you mentioned at one point that I was y'all's first guest, and now here you are at 300 episodes. All right, if you guys don't mind, can I ask you guys a question to start? 
Go on. Yes. This doesn't usually happen, man. No, but I okay, know. go I for know. it. <laughs> so you guys obviously follow football uh, as much as you follow American football. And one of the mm-hmm. things that as I've watched, and again, like I told you guys years ago, for some reason I picked leads. I don't know why I did it. It's you been poor a bastard. Uh, hey, <laughs> eight second in the championship league. So we may very well be back. But anyways, one thing I noticed about Premier League football that I have found so interesting is that people's patience overseas is drastically shorter than it is in the States. And I wanted to ask you guys that when it came to this, the quarterback civil war, I mean, if you have a striker that doesn't score a goal in six to seven games, (laughs) fans want him benched. If you go on a seven game skid in a 40 game season, fans want the coach gone and often they do they do get fired and they do get replaced how did you guys feel as this whole quarterback thing played out the way that it did because i don't think any of the four of us think that justin got your conventional shake at being a franchise quarterback and i'm not trying to argue that he did but it I have to imagine that y'all had at least a different perspective on just do you or did you not get get things done? Does that make sense? See, see I yeah. go, I well, go one further. I go one further than that. Sorry, can I go one further than that? I, hmm, I was going to use the H word. I stopped myself. I dislike Matt Eberflus for the exact reason you just explained. Mm-hmm. Because if Matt Eberflus was the head coach or the whatever you want to call it, director of football or whatever they call it in Ireland or in the UK. If he was that, his ass would be well gone. I mean, <laughs> gone. Right? There wouldn't even be a conversation piece. Right. And I, for my sins, so just to give you an example, I, for my sins, support West Ham. West Ham won their first ever trophy, well, first ever trophy, first trophy in 40 years last year. Right. And I would say 50% of the fan base want their want the manager fired, even though we're seventh, eighth, like, which is something the club has never had. English Premier League soccer or soccer in the, in Europe is a bit mental that way. Regarding the Justin stuff, I think it's 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 weird because fans in in the UK and in Europe with soccer they have this one player that they really like, even though he's a bit shit. I'm not saying that Justin was a bit shit, but he is a bit. So that's where there's a weird kind of love affair for that player. And uh, there was a player I remember as a kid called Thomas Repka who got sent off three games in a row, and every single fan adored him because he was a lunatic and that's part of the joys of, of where it is no one wants to i i let the, i jumped across the two lads maybe you have something different than i just articulate yeah yeah well look I, I, we all know on the show i always wanted caleb williams unlike tony truth comes out eventually <laughs> no no nah, nah, nah. uh, look i i i think we can all agree that Fields didn't get a fair shake, but I think where where it's different from the Premier League is I think the fact is there are so many games, so like you can go through like little spurts of not scoring, and then suddenly if you score in two or three games, everyone loves you again. Right. You don't quite have that with with the NFL because if you have a four or five game skid, your team has no chance of winning anything. So I think that's where unfortunately it really does come down there's similarities right like it's, if you build if you build your organization properly a quarterback even if they're not performing to the highest level can still be successful and it's similar enough in i guess all sports but that, i think that's the unfortunate thing for justin maybe just wrong quarterback wrong time and i think that's your, probably the way it goes and to your point playing even 17 games i mean there's nearly as many quarters in an NFL season as there is games in a Premier League season. There's more games or there's more quarter or there's more games in an NBA season or an NHL season than there are quarters in an NFL season. You start 0 and 4 and nobody really cares how much it was or wasn't one player's fault the Bears lost to Denver. The, if they had just gone 1 and 3 during that stand. And let's not mention a Tampa Bay game that was very winnable. Let's not mention like the, the Chiefs game was probably never going to happen happen but just one and three and then the rest of the season happens the way it does they go to green bay and they have a real shot at the playoffs there but all that to say like you're mentioning karen it's it's a game where you do have to deliver results and a lot of times you're not going to get the fair things asked of you sometimes you're going to be missing your number one receiver sometimes you're going to be missing half your offensive line and you just got to find a way to win a slobber knocker anyways, because not every game is going to break well for you. But then 
like you're mentioning Ant, I think it's hilarious because there's always that one player that's not very good, but everybody loves him anyways. It also feels like there's always that one player who's actually all right, but we hate him no matter what yes. he does. That's and it, it's just funny to I see. Have a, I have a lot of those players. So <laughs> Well, let's let's see let's see where we're going from where we are now on Bears wise. So everyone accepts what we what we're doing at one, except for some. There was a someone on who wants to watch them. Commanders desperately to get Williams and was saying that the Bears should take Daniels. Obviously, it's Williams. So we're moving to number nine, <clears throat> and at number nine, Jeff was on a couple of minutes ago, and I I agree with him. Number nine is the first real pick uh, for Matt for Matt. Love the way you put that. Eberflus, but also obviously for Ryan Poles and what it's going to look. And from from the perspective of where we're gonna where we're gonna see it, what we're gonna do now is Poles made a really interesting comment a while back. Mm-hmm. He turned and said, "I'm gonna break my team at home into three different sections. We're gonna look at wide receiver, we're gonna look at edge, and we're gonna look at offensive tackle." Right. So we've decided to do a little bit of that. So Robert, we're gonna make you into Poles. Okay. Right. So we are gonna come to you, and we're gonna say to you, "Here's the reasons why we think mm-hmm. certain spot." And then at the end of it, based on your own thoughts on what we've said, you're going to be able to make the call at night, right? Mm-hmm. So, because Alrighty. I'm the one talking, I'm going to start with Tony. Tony, I believe, is going to speak about the offensive tackles. Yeah, I am going to speak about the offensive th- tackles. So, Robert, Robert, listen, don't mm-hmm. listen to those two because they both wanted to keep Justin Fields. So, let's just get that out of the way first. <laughs> right, anyway, so, uh, moving on. I can see why you would look at the wide receiver position and think, I can get myself a blue chip player there. I can see why you would look at pass rush and say, I don't have a pass rusher to go opposite Montez Sweat that I feel entirely confident in, and that I can also get on a rookie contract. Completely get that. But what I will say to you, Robert, or Ryan, is that... He doesn't even know your name. I'll go by you. (laughs) (laughs) We (laughs) We have a rookie QB that we've just selected at number one overall. We have an offensive line that was questionable, um, Mm -hmm. more so in the interior. Um, However, what I would say is, you know, similar to the Justin Fields situation, if you have an opportunity to upgrade, you should possibly be looking at upgrading. Braxton Jones has done very well since he came in. I like Braxton Jones. I've always vouched on for him. However, Joe Alt is sitting there right now at number nine. I've no idea how he's fallen to number nine. Um, And Olu Fashnu is also sitting there at number nine. So my argument to you is to take one of these long-term generational, well, I'm not going to use that word, long-term starters at left tackle, upgrade over Braxton Jones, protect your rookie QB, and do the things for Caleb Williams that Ryan Pace did not do for Justin Fields when he arrived. And that's my argument to you. Whether you want to take Joe Waltz or Fashionu, up to yourself. But my argument is we should take the tackle. What say you? And do I get to respond or do yeah. you go straight to the next person? Yeah, no, you respond to that. Well, Scout Tony, I got to tell you, that's really interesting. I mean, on one hand, of course, we love our project in Braxton Jones. I picked him, you know. He was one of the best picks of my early draft. So Bri- or Braxton Jones' success is my success. That said... There's coming up a point here in a couple years where you have to pay Braxton. And as somebody who's obsessed with value, you got to acknowledge that the moment you pay Braxton Jones eight figures a year, he stops being the fun fifth round pick and he starts being an average tackle who hopefully he improves further, becomes an above average tackle. Maybe worst case scenario, you pay him decent money and he becomes kind of like Charles Leno, where you could do a lot worse. You could do a lot better, but you could do a lot worse, right? But to your point, if you have the opportunity to take a player that shouldn't be there and is only there because four quarterbacks and three special receivers went above him, well, then you're kind of playing with house money here and you get the opportunity to get a special player at that left tackle position that then is going to keep a lot of pieces on your offensive line cheap and allow everybody to grow together. And the only real concern I have, Tony, is are, are you concerned at all about rookie tackle growing pains? alongside one of the most important rookie quarterback seasons we've seen in Chicago in years? See, I'm going to jump in there. Yes. Because I believe that you are 100% correct. And that's, sorry, sorry. I am now moving to the other side of the football. And I'm saying to you that you need to look, general manager, you really need to look at our three-tech position. 
on our edge position. But I'm going to start with a three tech position. Why? I know you got Dexter last year. You love him. I don't. I think he's great. Zach Pickens has some real upside to him that can really do something. But these there's two guys in this in this draft that I think are just exceptional. And we spoke about it that when Justin Fields, you loved him as well. You thought he was a lovely man, but you wanted to upgrade. You wanted to get better, and that's what you did. You've done at one. Well, I believe you should also do it in the three tech position. That one position that your head coach is desperate to get right. The one position you tried to in your first year, and unfortunately it didn't work out. And I'll give you two names. Johnny Newton from Illinois. He even knows the area. His friends and family are there. He's going to be comfortable coming to Chicago. What a player that kid is. And of course, Brian Murphy. I mean, Murphy, Irish Bear Show. Of course I'm going to be telling you that. But there's two people right there at Tree Tech that could change the way we attack the football. And if you don't like the Tree Tech idea, I get it. Maybe Tree Tech is something that you want to see in growth and you, you like with Dexter. There's some edges there as well at nine. And you know what? We could even go back a couple of spots because if we've got all those players gone, there may be some quarterbacks and we may not have a chance opportunity to get our second round pick back. Maybe even get something a little bit more and still get someone like Vars or someone like Latu or someone like Dallas Turner, even though don't really think Dallas Turner might work. So going back to what you said at the very end about Tony, where you turn around and said, do you want to have a left tackle with your rookie quarterback? I'm going to turn around to you and say, can you not give up on your two three techs that are there, sitting there waiting for you, or the edge rusher? Well, here's what's so funny, Ant. To, To build off you and to break character just briefly, it's funny because as we've had this conversation for an awfully long time about number nine, where everybody's focused on wide receiver, who Kieran will get to you in a moment, offensive tackle, and edge rusher. But the more I keep watching these guys, the more I can't help but think that the two 21-year-olds playing three-tech might be better pass rushers than all three of the edge rushers we're talking about. And that's no discredit to Dallas Turner, who I think is an awfully solid player, or Jared Verse or Layatu Latu. Latu and Verse are both 23, going to be 24. So they're on the older side of prospects, which is generally something. I'm not trying to tell you you have to stay away from them, but breakout age happens for a reason. Really talented players pop when they're that much younger. And so suddenly you start looking at this, Ant, and I got to agree with you. The funniest part about Gervon Dexter is so far, what have we seen, right? We've seen a way better ability than we expected to play the pass. But also, we've seen a little bit of struggles in the run game. So are we sure he's the starting three technique if we have to line up and play an exhibition game tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe he could be. Maybe he couldn't be. But the Bears are going to have a better idea of that than we are. But here's what's also funny about Dexter. He also played one tech. He also played a little bit off the edge throughout the last season. He's not somebody who's so bound to one position and one position only at three technique that you would pass off of a player that if you stacked up Murphy, Newton, and Jalen Carter, this might be hot takey, but it is something I believe. If you compound like football character melded within your evaluation, it wouldn't surprise me if Carter, who may have tapped, I mean, we saw this last year, red hot to start the season. First eight, nine games, really phenomenal fell off in a hard way. Did he want to work as hard as plenty of these other first round picks do? Is that a reason that Ryan Poles seemed turned off by him? Does that mean that 21 year old Byron Murphy or 21 year old Johnny Newton? Yeah, that's right. Johnny Newton's played for what? Two or three years at Illinois. It doesn't change the fact that he's only about 21. And so could those guys surpass Jalen Carter in due time? And if they did, Guys, what would this Bears defense look like? And what would we say if Caleb Williams only on his worst day has to score 18, 20 points so, or to win a game in part because the pass rush is able to keep points off the board on the other side? It's definitely an intriguing thought. And if the Bears ultimately go pass rusher here, oh, I'm actually going to be pretty excited because chances are they've got a shot at a really solid player. But obviously, we left maybe the best option for last. So, Karen. I haven't read your report yet. What you got for me? Absolutely. So, well, the defense that we had last year was good. It ended, what, top five? Did we have an edge rusher capable of being that guy opposite Montez Sweat? No, we didn't. We're talking about Jervon Dexter. Was he a perfect pass rusher in the middle? No, he wasn't. But the Bears still got a top five defense. Do you really need much more than that? Probably not. We just saw a quarterback that we drafted fail miserably in Chicago. And one of the main reasons we keep saying is there's not enough weapons. There's not enough weapons. Well, I ask you, Ryan Pauls, 
do you like to see touchdowns? I like to see <laughs> touchdowns. The Bears fans like to see touchdowns. You want a new stadium. You want a button seat. We need to see touchdowns on this team. If we want to see Caleb Williams do what CJ Stroud did last year, guess what? We got to be scoring 40 points a game. And the only way you're going to do that, oh, it's great. You have DJ Moore. You have Keenan Allen. But you can do a little bit better. And there's two guys there that if we don't have four quarterbacks going in the top five, if there's not a Marvin Harrison Jr. in this draft class, if there's not a Joe Alt in this draft class, you probably have no way in hell of getting Malik Neighbors or Rowan Madunze. But you have the opportunity to draft one of those guys and to have a plan that if you don't want to pay Keenan Allen next year, you have someone to slot right back in. But again, I ask you this. What do you want? What do you think Bears Nation wants? What is the best option at number nine? My whole point is I don't like chasing a position. I don't like just chasing the an edge rusher or a three tech because maybe they're the best in the draft, but they're not worth the number nine overall pick. I want at number nine, this is the, we've said it before. This is really Ryan Paul's, your first real draft pick after the quarterback. Do you want to go reaching for a position because you need an edge rusher? No, you do not. You want the best blue chip player at that position. The best blue chip player at that position is a wide receiver. You pick a wide receiver. We all go happy, go home happy, and we all get to watch touchdowns in Chicago for the next decade. Thank you very much. Well, I love the argument, especially because if Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors falls to number nine, by all measures, they're going to be the best player available. So we all love best player available, right? And that leads you to a wide receiver. The question is twofold. First off, is one of those receivers going to fall for or to number nine? I don't actually know. I mean, at this stage, anybody from number four to number eight looks like they could be open for business for trading. And if you're telling me teams like Jacksonville, teams like Los Angeles, teams across that bottom area of the draft board aren't, aren't really looking at their options of what it's going to take to trade up for one of these guys, I think you're out of your mind. Right. But if the Bears do get a shot to draft one, man, I thought you were going to make this argument. I love the mentorship angle for Keenan Allen mentoring the young receiver so that that receiver can basically get a head start on how to position themselves against often zone coverages. Look, whenever I go on to other people's shows, I generally like to fit, pick their sav- favorite second sport and come up with a bunch of metaphors. And I did have one prepped for this, so I'm going to use it here. Uh, Thomas Muller was an outstanding talent for or in the Bundesliga. But one thing that got a or gave him a head start in his scoring ways, that's a striker uh, for the German national team for years, it was that Miroslav Klose, the a savant in terms of finding positioning was there to help Muller learn how to get into spots that were advantageous that allowed him to score. And the two have talked about how they worked together and learned a lot or, and that Muller learned a lot from Klosa. And if you're telling me that Keenan Allen, six time pro bowler wouldn't have an awful lot to teach either Malik neighbors or especially Roma Dunze, given that they share very similar body types, I think you're out of your mind. And, Allen should already be a great help to somebody like Caleb Williams, who I think needs a little bit of growth in that specific area of his game. Keenan Allen being somebody who wins within structure, Caleb is somebody who can do it, but just hasn't needed to be bound to it the way that I think quarterback requires you to be in the NFL. So Allen's a great person to have in the room, but the goal here is to win a Super Bowl in 2026, 2025, 2027, right? Keenan won't be 31 forever. He won't even be 32 forever. So thinking towards uh, the future, I think is definitely warranted here. And I don't think that there is a wrong answer as we talk through all of these options. Do I have to pick one now? You do yeah. indeed. Heck yeah. one. <laughs> so let's let's get let's be honest, right? So you've got on the board. Let's go with um, Joe Alt is there. Let's go with Roma Dunze is there, and let's go with both of the um, three tech guys. Pick. <laughs> so, so you basically the eight, eight quarterbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seven, quarterbacks. Seven, seven quarterbacks and Marvin Harrison Jr. That basically was the ter- first eight picks. And also Malik Neighbors, or is Neighbors there on the board? Board? Neighbors yeah, okay, is gone. Okay. He's gone. Okay, six, gone. six, gone. six gone. quarterbacks and two wide receivers. That's You've got Roma Dunze, the wide receiver. Let, 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 let's pick one from each. Roma Dunze, Joe All, and. 
Murphy. Byron Murphy. Right. So I got to tell you, I think the funny thing about these defensive prospects is that if you do get the opportunity to trade down. So I was doing a it, Bears fans, bear with me. I was doing a pro football network mock, and it's not like that's, you know, gold. Right. But Jacksonville offers for number nine, number 17, number 48 and a 2025 second round pick. And that's about a 15 percent overpay per draft charts. But the reason I mention this is because for as much as we talk about trading down and everybody goes, oh, you got to be kidding me. Why wouldn't you take a blue chip player? The only trade down options that are going to be on the board here, especially if Roma Dunze is there, is going to be an overpay. This is going to be a popular player. It's why I wouldn't be surprised if Jacksonville would then throw the same deal at Atlanta to try to get an or to try to get number eight. And it would be up to whether they would take it or not. Right. But so it wouldn't surprise me, Ant, if trading down leads you to that pass rusher because one of them will be there. And then even if you take Liatu Latu, or which I think would be my preference between him and Verse, or Verse, you get a solid player, a player that's plenty good. It's going to help the defense a lot. Maybe not that superstar, but you also get a second round pick that can become a receiver. And hey, they're helpful too in the second round. If you're asking me what I would do out of those guys, I personally lean Adunze. I mean, to me, all becomes uh, something that's on the table the moment Odunze and Neighbors and Marvin Harrison are all on the board and nobody wants to trade for Alt. But that's the other piece to this, Tony. If you had got to choose between Joe Alt or number 17, number 48, and a 2025 second round pick that now they're willing to come up to or something similar to that for Joe Alt, does the idea of J.C. Latham or Olu Fashanu or Tyree Spuaga or there's another one in there. There's a fifth offensive yeah. tackle. That's before we get into any of the defensive line players. Like, does the idea of potentially trading down and scooping up a good player, just not the best player at offensive tackle, pique your interest? Or are you pretty alt-centric? No, not at all. I mean, I, I, I'm all for trading down, but it really depends because you're taking a chance here. You don't know who's going to be available depending on how far you go down. No. I like fashion news, an alternative at left tackle. Absolutely. Uh, I think Latham uh, maybe doesn't. I don't know if he fits the 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 the, the sort of system uh, that we're we're going to be you running. Have some of these guys you'd kick into guard. You just yeah to make yeah. A and, and for me line. at that point, it's maybe a bit you know because because it's not going to fit. It might be a bit too rich for me. But fashion, new absolutely, I would absolutely look at that option instead. But then that's the whole thing where you're like people are obsessed with picks. Yes. Um, and it's all like you know trade back, we'll trade back, and we'll get all these picks. It's like you've no idea who's going to be there though. If you're sitting at nine and you've got an option of three blue chip guys, whether it's a pass rusher, a wide receiver, offensive tackle, whatever it is, if they're you in your blue box on your board, you just run to the to the to the table and you take them. You know, I don't. I, I think I think something for me, in my opinion, I think you overthink the the um, the lottery ticket. Thing, I totally you know? get that. Um, but you know, at the same time. If someone offers you a ridiculous amount to overpay, you definitely have to consider it because you have the future to consider as well. But given the fact that next year we have a ton of picks, um, I would feel confident and I would I would be more inclined, given that we have a chance to take a really good blue chip player, to stick there this season um, oh. and, and, and take them. So I have no inside information when I say this. This is just me thinking out the board as of now. Right. Kieran, you're really excited about Roma Dunze. So is everybody mm -hmm. else. Right. You look at Lance Zerline's mock. He's got the Bears taking Roma Dunze. Yes, says the Bears fan. Then you look at Daniel Jeremiah. He's got the Bears getting Roma Dunze. Yes, I'm says mine. the Bears fan. <laughs> and you hit this point where I think that it's almost becoming so obvious that a Roma Dunze would fall to the Bears that if somebody wants him, you're going to talk to Atlanta. And then it's a matter of, is Atlanta dead set on Dallas Turner? Which you got to hope they are, right? They desperately need an edge rusher. Or are they comfortable trading down? If that answer is yes to me, I think four quarterbacks, Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Joe Alt at seven, and then a trade-up for, for Roma Dunze at eight makes all the sense in the world. And the Bears are left with a board that is basically, do you want your best defensive player at nine, or do you want to try to move down? And then Tony to your point, takes two to tango just because you want to trade down doesn't mean anybody wants to come up. And so I'm, then at that I'm, point, do you even yeah. have an offer? See, for me, and I, I'll finish up on this one, for me, the worry to watch on this is the Jets. 
I've, I've been taught it for a while. Jets at 10 going up to Atlanta um, and Atlanta then still be able to get Dallas Turner at 10. That would be, if I'm if I'm both the Jets and Atlanta, that's what I'm thinking. Robert, it's been brilliant having you on. You were here on episode one where we're talking about Andy Dalton. And now we're talking about like Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze oh, and like real prop players, not some 45-year-old left tackle that we had back then. Absolutely brilliant to have you on, my man. Can't wait to see what you're doing now as editor in chief of the Bears blog. Uh, thank you so much as always. You're a very, very good man. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. Love it. Congratulations. Cheers, thank man. you, Robert. Good, you bet. Before we go to our next guest, we have a, a couple of other uh, comments that I wanted to get to, just because again the guys put in some some uh, dollar bills. Uh, we have congrats on your three hundred show. Great work, and then Matt as well. Congrats on 300 lads. Here's to the next 300. So we appreciate all of that, guys. And look, we are going to move on to our next guest. And I'd say the Bears contingent from the NFL Network. And I think he's going to need to start talking to some of his colleagues over there. Adam, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, thank you. First of all, congratulations on 300. It's a it's an honor to be here on a, such a festive occasion. I would have my one of my favorite numbers is 299. So I'm I'm bummed that I missed the 299 show. Like, oh, it's, it's not even a joke. It's not even a joke. For the longest time, I would only follow 299 people on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it has grown, but it's it is my favorite. Now, there's a reason why, and uh, if you're, it's if you know the teams that I root for, it's not difficult to figure out. But in any event, being here for 300 is a momentous occasion. So congratulations to all of you, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. So, Adam, then what I think you should do after every single draft, whoever gets picked 299th overall, you need to interview every Ooh. single year. It's the only way to do it. That's a good idea. I didn't even think about that. Um, because it's not it's not a it's not a football thing, it's a baseball thing. But uh mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. You're welcome. Anyway, let's get back to the bears. Um obviously everybody is in Caleb Williams, yeah, all that mold is what's been your opinion of kind of everything that's happened this year obviously in terms of this offseason has been kind of crazy on on bears twitter it's nice to get away from that a little yeah. bit and just talk on the pod but we always say that i think the bears are just in a very fortunate position now that you happen to have traded with a team that lost the most amount of games and you end up with the number one overall pick in a quarterback rich draft class this doesn't usually happen to us bears fans usually when we get high picks it's in a class that there's not very good quarterbacks right. so as we're only about 20 or so days out from the draft how do you feel as a bears fan going into it i feel really good you know this goes back to last season when i do my predictions and a lot of people would tell me last year the bears are going to be picking first overall to which i always responded with i don't think carolina is going to be that bad and obviously they were trying to take a swipe at the Bears, but I turned it on them. And then Carolina actually does end up being that bad. Carolina tanks for us. And then we could go out there and win a bunch of games and start to establish a little bit of a winning culture to which I thought that perhaps we'd be able to move out of the top spot, get a lot of picks to build around Justin Fields. I think I was pretty open and honest with that, very transparent. That's the direction I would have gone. But at the same time, like I'm not going to argue with – you know, Ryan Poles wanted to go with a quarterback. It's fine. Like, it's somebody like you go to a bar and you're like, I'll take a, a harp on draft. You're like, we don't have that. You're like, fine, give me whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm still fine. I, it wasn't my first choice, but I'll still be very happy with a Schmidt Wicks or whatever. It doesn't matter. So I, I feel like it's fine. Like, I, I understand the math of it. And I'm also enough of a mature human being to be like, okay, that's done. My One of my favorite players is traded. And uh, I'm going to move on. I actually, I thought about this the other night. I meant to take a photo. My, uh, my two kids, you know, they're going to sleep. My daughter in her bed, she's, she has her normal pillow, but she also has a Shohei Otani pillow and a Justin Fields pillow. And I'm like, oh, I guess we're going to have to switch those out. <laughs> both of them, <laughs> both of them are gone. Jesus. <laughs> so, but I mean, you, again, you're just like, okay, well, I'm going to root for the players that are here. And, and it looks like well, it is Caleb Williams is going to be our quarterback. I know that there's been a lot of, talk going the other ways and of course uh, not to promote my own show here but on the weekend edition of the sick podcast 
coming up. We have Matt Harmon this evening, but we will be having Cynthia Freeland on Friday. So we won't really touch on too much of what she said about Jaden Daniels going to the Bears or anything like that. I'll let her get the opportunity to address Bears fans then. And uh, until that time, we're not going to talk about it. I don't, I'm not of the same mind. I, I, I just don't agree because to me, the only thing that sold me on moving Justin Fields was that we're getting Caleb Williams, who I really do believe is a great quarterback, is the best quarterback in this draft. And if you looked at the last two draft class, Caleb Williams would still be my number one guy. Like Caleb Williams, CJ Stroud, and then probably Bryce. Bryce, Bryce Young still might end up being pretty good, so I'm not worried about that, but still over the other guys. And then the guys in this draft, it's, it's interesting because we could see an instance where four guys – are taken very early. I don't believe in any of that. Like I, I'm almost I'm I'm putting together my mock draft with a twist. I don't do a prediction predictive version of the mock draft. I do a suggestion. Like I'm like a consultant, you know, like one of the two bobs from Office Space. Where I just come in, I'm like, this is what you should do. So I would walk into the commander's office and be like, don't draft a quarterback. You guys aren't a quarterback away from competing. You might as well trade with the Minnesota Vikings and get two extra first-round picks and go that way. Because honestly, once you get past Caleb, I don't think any of those guys – I don't think any of these guys are that good, to be perfectly truthful with you. I I think they'll be fine, but I think that – especially uh, – don't sell me on Drake May. I swear to God. I'm like, we – there is a Drake <laughs> May in every draft going back to Blake Bortles. Like, there is going to be some six four white guy in every draft. We don't it's, – it's not that special. We don't Will need Levis pick. last year. <laughs> Will Levis last year. Like I'm, I'm putting together this thing, and I know how my editors work, so they're gonna make me put like, well, you got to put a, you can't, you can't go through this whole thing and not put Drake May in the first round. I'm like, fine. Um, but I, I, I think that the Bears are in in such a unique spot, and it's, and it's interesting as I'm getting, you know, ratioed on Twitter for what I said about the Texans today. Which I that was <laughs> I could have I could have thought that out better. Like there's sometimes like and people are like on me and I'm like I I do stand up like I'm used to jokes bombing like no shit like that but <laughs> I could have done better I could have worded that better uh, and I'll wear the ratio but it's kind of fun it's kind of fun getting ratioed sometimes it's like okay getting some interaction uh, what I won't stand for is people uh, roasting the angels that's an insta block but other people calling me clowns <laughs> calling me a dipshit I'm like ah that's fine. And then some guys like the Angels only beat the Marlins. Like fuck off, you're blocked. Jimmy. By the way, I, I, I'm so sorry. Can I work blue here? I am. So work sorry. away, my man. Uh, yeah. Work away. Nothing is off limits, uh, man. So Always. I was like, so it's funny. Like there have been people saying like really like mean shit to me today, to where it's like, eh, yeah, you're probably right. And then some guys like the Angels only beat the Marlins. I'm like, fuck you. Boom. <laughs> Could not have blocked them fast enough, and I'm in a great mood. The Angels won. They swept the Marlins. Arsenal won two nil with all their backups playing. Like this was a great day, and yet I was still uh, nerved enough. And maybe it's because I've been spending too much time on Bears Twitter that I'm still sort of like, sort of apprehensive because this should be the best time of our lives as Bears fans in quite some time because we are going to get Caleb Williams. We we I, I was listening to your conversation coming in about what to do at number nine. Like we need to understand, like. We could be in a position where we're we're not getting Caleb Williams, and we're doing like we're trying to figure out what to do at nine, you know, and not not having like we like we're we're in such a luxurious position, and that it's nice to be in, and we should be celebrating this. We should not be angry at each other. We should not be doing anything where we're we're attacking anybody for their opinions or anything because everybody has. This is one of the few times where a lot of these opinions are valid, not not the dipshittery that's going on. But I mean, like anybody, like. I understood both sides of Justin Fields and Caleb Williams. Like, I, I, everything makes sense. Like, you're, it's just one of those things where you're like, hey, Caleb Williams, reset the quarterback clock, generational talent. Like, oh, I can believe that. Like, oh, but if you build around Justin Fields, he could end up being the guy. I'm like, oh, I can believe in that too. Like, there was really no wrong answer, so to speak. I'm loving this right now, and I'm thrilled to try to figure out the puzzle pieces of what the Bears are going to do at number nine. And if I could just jump into it, you know, because I, I, again, working on my piece for next week for NFL.com, I have the Bears, I suggest taking Roma Dunze. And 
did I kind of fudge the board to make sure Roma Dunze? <laughs> of course. You know what? Because this is me being a consultant. And I'm like, hey, Chargers, like, you should take a lineman. And Falcons, <laughs> you should take Dallas Turner. But at the same time, the, first of all, by the way, can I say this about the Falcons? I'll give you a little preview. The Falcons have a chance to do the funniest thing ever and just take Brock Bowers. Because I would just love to see the internet explode. If the Falcons took Brock Bowers, like people would lose their goddamn minds. Like people would just go nuts. Like, yeah, Kyle Pitts, Brock Bowers, let's go. Um, but I really do think that there's an opportunity for Roma Dunze to be available for the Bears at number nine. I do know who the coach of the team is, and Matt Eberflus is going to be, you know, pitching Jared Verse uh, or if Dallas Turner falls. Pitching one of those guys, and I get it. Like, I, I understand – and I know that we 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 traded a fourth rounder for Keenan Allen, and it's great. But it's like, let's go all the way in. Let's let's cannonball. Let's let's cannon. There's a difference between cannonballing, but you're cannonballing in a speedo. Like, let's go all the way. Let's make this a full. Let's make this a full thing. Screw all it. Go, screw, it. screw it. Go seventy five wide receiver as well. Go go one twenty two well, tight end. Everybody the pass rush. Run, all, run them back the whole. We'll show. get. We were good enough on defense last year. We're we're fine. Thank you. We, you, can still go, better, yeah. you know what? Like we got once we got Montez Sweat, that was in. So we could, you know, you're not going to be able to draft in the top ten again. I hope. <laughs> I hope we're not picking in the top ten for quite some time. That's why I don't like trading out too. Because I, I I've I've Same. mentioned this and I, yeah. I forget who it was who brought it up to me the first time. And this again made a lot of sense. So I want I'm now stealing it. And not giving any attribution, uh, it might have been it might have been Brian Perez who said this, but in any event, it's it's mine now. So here we go. <laughs> we're we're probably not going to be dra- but no, we're probably not going to be drafting in the top ten for quite some time. So you want to go out and take advantage of it, and take advantage of absolutely the best person possible, even to the point of like wanting to trade up to number five to get your pick at wide receiver, which might not be necessary because one of those guys could fall. But again, this is it. And, I, and and again, like this is what I was trying to get at when I was talking about the Houston Texans. Now, obviously, like I'm again, this is this is on me. Uh, this is my sometimes you gotta work on the wording. Like I get it. Like I'm I already have the bridges connected in my mind that other people aren't. So yeah, I, I it came off as very basic. Like, but the the Texans model of what I meant was going in so hard in one draft of like getting your quarterback of the future and then getting that defensive guy, like adding all those pieces, like the, 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 the Texans didn't drag it out. They didn't, they didn't draft their quarterback. And then they're like, well, we're going to get more stuff. Like, no, they went all in right at that point. And that was kind of what I was alluding to, uh, which I could, again, could have worded better. I could see the bears doing that being like, you know what? Like, fuck it. Let's go. Let's, that was, we're, we're going to be picking. We're going to be picking in the twenties. Next year, let's just go all in right now and see what we can do. So I think this should be an exciting time. And I don't want to sit here and I'm up late. You guys, it's early morning for you. You guys have, I I feel bad because you guys must wake up every morning and go, Jesus Christ, what is going on with Bears Twitter? Like what happened Pretty much. (laughs) Trying to like, what are you guys arguing about? And it's the whole thing. And like, you know, and and the whole thing with uh, Bear Down Cuz and the votes like ob- like honestly like i i know mikey mikey doesn't give a shit and he wouldn't he's he's not buying a bot but his fans are great and uh they're very passionate and so obviously somebody did that and they went out there and they did it and i know too because like i've been in some of these like comedy contests and somebody's purchased a bot for me i'm like oh son of a b and they just assume <laughs> Like, oh, you're very popular. You're like, no, somebody did this, but <laughs> can I give back the prize money? Because I certainly didn't earn this. <laughs> well, it's any consolation. It's any consolation. We get to watch really late on a Tuesday morning games like the Bears against the Vikings last year. Oh, what was yeah. it 10, 12? Yeah, that was that was, that was <laughs> three o'clock in the morning, quarter quarter to four. And I've got like, two kids under the age of five who have me up at six. So, I don't yeah, like it. Was- I don't like it that way for you guys. Like for me. I live on the West Coast in uh, Southern California. And so a lot of the Premier League game, Arsenal's game was at 11.30 a.m. today, which is very reasonable. I actually don't like that because, and my kids like watching sort of Arsenal. They come 
run in, scream, and then like, you know, and then they bounce around and do whatever. I, I prefer when the games are on at five in the morning because I'm like, nobody's up. Nobody's I'm just sitting there <laughs> drinking coffee. I can concentrate. I don't have to worry about anything. Um, but the late ones, God, that because you got to have like, you got to make it like, don't you have to make a decision? Because oh, my yeah. friend, my friend Nick, who's an Angels fan, is up super late watching Angels and God damn, Angels baseball. Like, what an atrocious, like, <laughs> I, I barely want to stay up till 8 p.m. watching this sometimes. <laughs> uh, you're up till, I can't even do the math, but it's got to be so tough sometimes. And you're so excited and it's 12 to 10. Like, oh, great, four field goals. Yeah, the, the schedule the schedule comes out every year and then I then go through it and go right I need to take this Monday off I need to take that Tuesday off I need to do this that and the next thing honestly man like the no. start of my holiday planning is around the bear schedule and then after that you know we'll take the family on holiday you know so yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense it's full on it's full on man like it's it's definitely tiring um, yeah, and you start your holiday with the Bears losing to the Packers every year, basically. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> if they, they're oh. going to do that to us, I know they're going to do that to us again. They're going to, we're going to have to oh, turn yeah. the Packers and we, because they, like, if they, I honestly, and I wish I was, uh, you know, we don't really get this platform on the, um, on the uh, fantasy show, uh, because I always want to address this. Like, the schedule maker, I don't know what the hell he does. Like it's just asshole. It just doesn't seem like, like, a I, <laughs> like it's just one of those things. Like, well, you got to take in. Like nobody shares a stadium anymore. Like, yeah, well, Baltimore shares a parking lot. I'm like, who gives a fuck? Like, I don't care. <laughs> take an Uber. Like that shouldn't be a concern of what time I'm watching a football game. Is it some asshole going to an Orioles game? Is uh, impacting whether the Ravens get the home the home opener or not. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make it makes no sense at all. Like how Baltimore that year got robbed of hosting the kickoff game because the Orioles schedule. Like, no, no. And I want another and another thing. Like no divisional games before Week Five. Like that is so unfair because and especially for us because we're gonna have a rookie quarterback that we need. Like he needs those first. For, he needs that first month to get settled into the NFL. But you know goddamn well they're going to throw him at Lambeau. And week one. Week, well, absolutely. Yeah. Week one. <laughs> Monday, night time, football. Monday night football. <laughs> Packers playing host to the Bears. Just so everybody can victory lap one last time. Listen, they did it to the Angels this year. Like the Angels, like obviously the Dodgers and Padres opened in Korea the first game of opening day for no fucking reason was the angels. Why? 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 You know why? So they can make fun of us for not having Otani and all you guys are like, Oh, here it goes. Angels suck again, which they all, they've all disappeared now that they're four and two, but at the same time, it's just annoying. And they're going to do that to us. So if I could, I would make like no, no divisional games before week five. As a matter of fact, to the point, I would make week and the NFL loves tent pole events. Week five, when people start waning, when the interest starts waning, and I, I see the numbers, so I know it does. Uh, week five would be rivalry week. So you would know that every year in week five, the Bears play the Packers, the 49ers play the Rams, the Steelers play the Ravens, and who can I don't know. Can they I add to that? Can yeah, I add yeah, to that? Please do, Again, please. We, in week six, you have the, the reverse. So then you have like rivalry two weeks in a row. So you yeah. have like Bears Packers in Lambeau week five, and then week six it's in Soldier Field. So you get proper lunatic well, ideas. I, I would I would like to end the season with the rivalry. rivalry in week eighteen. I would actually, but you could, but like to that point, like you would be like, then you would play the Lions, then you would play the Vikings, and then you could do it that way. So you continue to have rivalries going on. And then your bye weeks, so five, six, seven. Yeah, so your bye weeks would then start in eight. So you'd only have a bye week at eight, nine, 10, and 11. And it's two divisions at a time. Like, figure it out. Like, map it out. Tell Taylor Swift to schedule your concert around. And that's the thing they thought. Like, well, like, some places hold concerts. I'm like, the Rams could not host a Taylor Swift-like concert, to my knowledge. I don't know. Like, tell Taylor Swift, like, she can't be here. Like, this is our schedule. This is the way it goes. 
On the, on, the, the, on the subject of the schedule, Adam, then, so what, what are your thoughts about uh, the Bears international game coming up this year? Obviously, coming back over to London, first time since 2019. Are you a fan of giving up a state-based game uh, to, to, to kind of encompass all the travel and all the, all the shit that goes along with that? Well, to my knowledge, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that with the uneven number of games... So you have like the 17 game schedule. The game you give up is the extra one. So that I believe there's still eight home dates. I think there's still yeah. eight games in Chicago. Yeah. So you're giving up that one, which sort of like, because 17 is such a dumb number. But then the Premier League does no, 49 or whatever, but whatever. Like just do 18 already. I know that's what you want to do. You want to have 18 games, just do it. Just yeah. already do it. And I know that they've already put it in the works. And I swear to God that at some point it's just going to come out because they'll have to do two bye weeks. It's going to turn out that the Super Bowl is going to be the week before Selection Sunday for March Madness. Like that's they're trying to own all of February because like February is such a dead month for yeah. sports, at least in the United States. Not for me. It's still Premier League. Like there's still shit going on. Uh, call it like college basketball or whatnot. The NFL is going to try to own that too. Like the NFL is trying to go year round. Like once, once they decided we're going to have a Wednesday, we're having two Wednesday, we're having two Wednesday um, games on Christmas. Like hold, you're done. Like you you just had to take that from the NBA. Like you couldn't let them like who, like whatever. Um, I, and we had a meeting, we had like this town hall meeting and they, you know, they're asking people, and so it's always funny, like, because, you know, you, you got to, like, you know, you should ask the question, like, why are we doing a Wednesday? Because you got to remember, like, uh, human beings work those days. Like, we're going to have to work. And uh, why are we doing this? And it's always fun to watch whomever's up there give the, like, corporate, like, well, you know, growing or blah, 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 and doing this and doing that. Like, you know what? Just once, just come out and say, like, we want the money. We yeah. want the money. Like, this is why we're laying a bunch of people off. We want the money because we know that we don't have to put resources into something that people are already going to watch. So like, okay. Like, it's kind of like if, uh, like I know now when I take my kids out to dinner, like they're not like when you order them a meal, they're not eating the meal. They're just going to eat the fries. So I'm just like, fuck it. <laughs> I, I order them fries. And their mother asked me, like, what do they have for dinner? I'm like, fucking French fries. But the only difference <laughs> is, is I didn't pay for these burgers or whatever because it's, true, uh, it's going to waste. Yeah. It's just going to go to waste. So why do this song and dance? They have to drink their protein supplements. They're fine. Um, <laughs> the NFL is the same way. It's like, oh, we could, we could pretty much not do anything. And you guys are going to watch. So let's just do that. Um, I don't know. But uh, there, but hey, football on Christmas. I'm looking forward. Yeah, they're a couple of games away, adding in until they're going to have a Super Bowl on Paddy's Day. <laughs> that's the, that's the way it's going to turn. I out. would think that it would be carnage. It's the goal. Like it is really the goal. I believe. <laughs> yeah. Just want a, a big party that whole week, and yeah, yeah. that would be that would be very, very funny. Season, man. That's what we're well, it's <laughs> it's already it's already missed. I don't know how into college basketball you guys are. But there have been years where March Madness has taken place over St. Patrick's Day weekend. Or the worst of it was, and this is back in the day, back when I was single and I didn't have kids or do whatever, we'd fly to Las Vegas. And it was actually the worst when St. Patrick's Day was on a Wednesday because we'd be flying to Vegas. So your first night in Las Vegas was St. Patrick's Day, which just kind of sets a set, just sets you up on, on the road to ruin. Of just like, this is just going to be terrible and I'm not going to recover and I'm going to have to come home three days early. But uh, it was a lot of fun, I got to admit. Yeah, absolutely. But look, when we talk about the Bears moving forward and one thing we mentioned on kind of earlier on in the show. Was, oh, I forgot this was a Bears podcast. Sorry, yeah. Uh, no, we're, we're all good. I'm sorry yeah. to all the fans who are who, who, who <laughs> endured this. I'm like, okay, get to the point at some, at some time. I'm so sorry. But one of the interesting ones, and we've spoken about this before, and it seems like this is the first time I see a Bears GM with a plan where yeah. it's like, okay, this actually makes sense to where the 
the conversation topic around Caleb Williams is more of, is he going to be a Andrew Luck type quarterback that comes in? And then all the arguments become of who are they go at nine? I guess when it comes to that, what's your opinion on when Caleb comes in? Do you think he can get to kind of that level where it's not just, oh, he was a, a good quarterback, but when you think of a number one overall pick that can actually change kind of the structure of the franchise because we're talking about the Houston Texans and yeah. what they've just done. And really it changed for them once they drafted CJ Stroud, because before that, nobody really knew what the Texans were doing to get him. Then they draft Will Anderson. Bears also have two top 10 picks this year. For me, I think this is like the make or break. If mm-hmm. Ryan Poles gets this right, he's probably the GM here for the next 10 to 15 years. If he gets it wrong, he's probably gone in three or four years. Now, what's your kind of confidence level that obviously Caleb Williams, but then you're sitting at nine in a draft class where there's likely going to be four quarterbacks taken before you're even at nine. So what's your confidence level for the bears moving forward after this draft? I'm, I'm very confident in what they've put together because they've, they've allowed or they've positioned themselves to be competitive. Now, Caleb Williams is already joining a team that last season won seven games, lost three games where they had over a 90% chance of winning in the fourth quarter. Like, Matt, like this is the thing that's crazy. When everybody talks about the Bears, I'm like, you understand, like they could have legitimately gone into that week 18 games, week 18 game with 10 wins to where the outcome of that game against the Packers wouldn't have mattered. Wouldn't have mattered. They could have benched. They would have, they would have rested everybody. And it would have, it actually would have probably saved Justin Fields' job. And they would have rested guys and they would have gone to the playoffs. And who knows what would have happened? Would they have beaten the Cowboys? Who knows? But they would have been in the playoffs and it would have been a completely different situation, except, or the only difference would be that they would be drafting outside of the top 10. So it probably maybe worked out a little bit better. Well, actually, you know, because you got to think about it. Like if they make the playoffs, they trade out of number one. They're getting multiple picks and we're going and it's a it's a different trajectory. But Caleb Williams is joining a team that's very close to the playoffs, that has a playoff ready defense, that has an offense that is starting to to come together a little bit. I really do believe that DJ Moore last year proved himself to be one of the top five receivers in the NFL. I firmly believe that. I think he is one of the best guys in the NFL. You bring in Keenan Allen, who statistically had a better year than Stephon Diggs, who went for a second-round pick. We got Keenan Allen for a fourth-round pick. So now you've got a team that's got Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, who I really like. I think DJ, I think DeAndre Swift is a huge upgrade at, uh, at the running back position. you got an offensive line that's starting to come together. Hopefully Ryan Bates will solidify things in the middle. And that, that's, another, uh, that's another thing, too. Like, if the Bears do trade down, because it would be too early at number nine to take Powers Johnson. Like, that's just way too early. But if the Bears wanted to move down to acquire more picks, that would be the guy that I would expect them to be targeting if they do something like that. But, yeah, and and like we said, you you already have the number nine pick to play with. And there's really not going to be a wrong choice here, whether it's Roma Dunze, whether it's Malik Neighbors. Even if you wanted to go with Brock Bowers, you know, in that kind of situation – you have the 12 personnel, and I know that you signed Gerald Everett in the offseason, but you might find it too tantalizing to pass up Brock Bowers. I don't anticipate it, but you know, I, I could listen to the argument. The offensive linemen that are available, I don't know if they quite, because there's so many right tackles in this draft that it's a little bit like when you're talking about JC Latham and, and players like that. They're like, I even doing my own mock draft, I'm like, God, there's so many teams that already have right tackles. But I feel bad for some of these guys because they're probably going to get passed over because they're just not a, a scheme fit. There is the guy, um, is it Dunham from Duke, who could end up, but again, like too rich for number nine. So they're really in an excellent position to not only grab a top 10 player to go along with Caleb Williams, but also if they wanted to trade back and get additional capital. I'm, I'm, I, again, like I, I just want to prepare myself for this and I think we should all be prepared. We're going defense, like no matter what we say. And we fantasy book all these wide, like they're going defense. 
the, I wouldn't be surprised if they even went with like a, another another corner. Like we can never have too many corners. Uh, no, that's that's a bit extreme. My well, one of the intro. Sorry, Adam. I just I I saw a few things coming up just on the screen a few minutes ago that apparently Caleb Williams was having dinner with the Bears and some of the Bears players yesterday. Yeah. And then Ramadunes is due in yeah. Chicago tomorrow. So it'll be very interesting to see if Caleb actually stay in Chicago for a day or two and then having both of them there, seeing how they react together. Because if you're planning on hoping to draft Ramadunes, you're going right. to have to hope that he has good chemistry with Caleb. And I wonder if he ends up staying and they actually get to kind of link up and that's something that the Bears might want to see as well. The fact that they're so close together on these 30 visits, it wouldn't shock me to see or them want to see kind of how those two guys get along as well. No, that wouldn't shock me either. And and going back to your point about like how, with the question of like how quickly can we expect him, Caleb Williams, to pick this up and uh, to get going. Here's the thing about the NFL players and the NFL, you know, being a business and people kind of understanding the score – I really appreciate what Jalen Johnson was saying, still sticking up for Justin Fields. That was his guy. I'm glad that he kind of, you know, put in it, put, you know, was backing up Justin Fields and, and putting it out there that like Caleb Williams just doesn't come in here and immediately get respect just because he's the number one overall pick. But I will tell you that once they get out to practice and they see Caleb Williams throwing the football, that tune changes immediately. You're like, oh, <laughs> if that guy can go out there and play, which we anticipate that he can, like that part of it's washed. That's squashed before we even get to training camp. Then that's fine. And of, of course, he's going to go out there and do his thing. His teammates love him. Everybody at USC loves him. So that's not going to be an issue for me. And again, he's going to walk into a team where you're like, look, you don't need to play hero ball. This isn't, this isn't last year's USC defense. This is a good defensive team. Get out there, spread the ball to your teammates, you can kind of check down. I know that's not something he did at USC a lot, but again, you know what? When you're playing with it, when you're playing in the NFL, you're going to have to learn that kind of stuff. And I believe that he can. So I, I feel like he could be very successful. I don't want to say that he's going to throw for 4,000 yards because why put those kind of expectations? But I do expect the Bears to have as many, if not more wins than they did last season. I, I mean, double digit wins to me should be the expectation. Is if, if the, the floor for Caleb Williams should be high enough that that's attainable. Curious, I, I want to circle back to a point you made a, a couple of minutes ago, Adam, regarding uh, if the Bears had won those sort of games where they were 90% likely to win, yeah. that they maybe would have kept the hold of Justin Fields. Going off of the fact that we already spoke about that, you know, they, they likely won't be a number one pick again for a while. Do you still think they would have kept Justin Fields or do you know, would have said, do you know what? It's been three years. We've sort of seen what we have from him. We're going to have to pay him a lot within a year. We're sitting at number one and we have a chance to take Caleb Williams. Do you, do you actually, do you think that Ryan Poles would have, would have stuck with Fields there, given if we got 10 wins, made it to the playoffs, got knocked out in the first round? Would that have been enough? Or, or do you think you would have said, you know what, Caleb Williams is too much of a hot prospect to pass up on and get in that rookie contract? That's a very interesting question because I'm trying to think. I know that it's not unprecedented because Kansas City was pretty decent with Alex Smith when they drafted Patrick Mahomes. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty confident in saying that the, the Chiefs were a playoff team when they yeah. drafted Patrick yeah. Mahomes. Yeah. So there's... I guess that, yeah, I, again, could be misreading the situation. I just feel like it would have been way, way more difficult because now, I mean, I'm not taking shots at Justin Fields or anything like that, but that loss against Denver, sort of his fault, that fumble, like, you know what? You got to see that, you know, you, you can't make that, like that fumble that was returned for a touchdown, sort of his fault. You know, some of these losses, some of the things you're like, you can point at and be like, you know what? I wish you would be further along in your development. Now, part of it, maybe a lot of it, is the fact that you're in the middle of a rebuild and you didn't get a fair shot here with Chicago. And that's understandable. It's very easy. Like, again, like it was very easy for Ryan Poles to sell that. Like, hey, you know what? Like, we're not quite where we should be and it's time to restart the quarterback clock. Okay. I just know that the conversation would have been so different if he would have been in the play. I just... 
I think he could have. Like, I mean, I think Ryan Poles has shown like he's doing his thing and he's not really paying attention to what we think. I I don't think that you know what to, to answer your question. I don't think it's a hundred percent certainty that we would have kept Justin Fields if we had made the playoffs, but it would be more likely than it was uh, than what we saw. And you know what? His his price tag might have been higher too uh, for making a trade. Like maybe one of these teams would have given us uh, something more than a fourth round pick, which by the way, I'm, a, I'm already assuming he's going to make that. I'm assuming he's going to start enough to where he's a fourth round pick and I won't feel as bad about my life. But uh, yeah, like it, it, it certainly isn't a certainty that uh, he would have stayed had they made the playoffs, but it would have made the decision way more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Even the fact that when we look at the Bears this year, it's it's a strange one because I think Ryan Pauls mentioned it when people were asking him, oh, you only have four picks this year. He's like, yeah, but we've selected like 25 players over the last two years. It's That's- an interesting one that we, that, we get to, that we get to talk about for this draft because it seems like a lot of people are saying that there's going to be this massive drop off, and the fact that the Bears have a lot of picks next year, but they, and this is why kind of I've always been against the idea of trading down at nine. I'd rather yeah. just have two like stars in the top ten, and just even if those are the two main guys and whoever else you get at seventy five, and and later on are just kind of role players, that's good. Every team is looking for at least one star in the draft class. If you come out with two you're playing with house money at that stage. And that's why anytime I see, oh, Bears need to trade back here, I'm like, nah, just take whoever the best guy is at nine and let's move on and let's party. And you also have to account Montez Sweat and Keenan Allen being a part of this draft class as well. Yeah. So then if, if, you, if you think about it where it's Caleb Williams, Roma Dunze, Montez Sweat, and Keenan Allen, no matter who they pick in the second round, that's pretty, that's good. pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Look, Adam, we really appreciate your time joining us on this special episode. We hope you do really well over the next couple of weeks that you can enjoy this kind of process going forward. We hope your angels do a little bit better as well. So hey, it's, it's, been good, it's been a good sports day today, uh, this being the best part of it. But thank you so much. And by the way, if anybody is uh, wanting to stay up a little bit later, uh, in about an hour and a half, I'll have Matt Harmon on Take It to the Rank. We'll be talking about Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors, and of course, Marvin Harrison Jr., and uh, talking about some Bear stuff. And later this week, Cynthia Freeland will be joining us. Sorry to be taking this opportunity to plug my shows, but... Yeah. Work away. Work away, my man. Can you always, say always, that? always working. Listen, I, you sure, just got to I'm ask sure her the question about what she was talking about earlier on, though. I need to know why she doesn't want to take Caleb Williams. Well, I'm going to be tuning in for that one for definite. Whew, she's a Lions fan? I don't know. I would love, I would That's love gonna be it. There's, there's the answer right there. There's the answer. Absolutely. Look, Adam, we really do appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Congratulations once again. Thank you so much, Adam. Talk to you later. Look, it is great having look Adam on all these all these guests on the show. It is it is a, a fun time for us here obviously 300 episodes into the podcast it's we we don't take this lightly and that's why we wanted to make today a little bit of a a special show because it's something that i think we do forget that when we get to kind of even when it was like 100 and 200 where you don't always kind of celebrate these things and i think it is important and it's interesting that we started off this this whole podcast where and it was you and me talking about andy dalton and then we, and basically we spent weeks and weeks and weeks for trying to convince ourselves that the Bears are going to trade up for Justin Fields. And then they do that. And it doesn't work because they don't build around them and all that. But then we, we're coming into this three years of doing the show and the Bears are now in a position to where they're going to get the top guy. Like We've never had that before, right? Like obviously we picked the first quarterback in the draft where Mitch Trubisky was the quarterback, but that still was a draft class. Obviously, looking back, Patrick Mahomes was in it, but going into it, not everybody was saying that, oh, this quarterback needs to go number one because it was Miles Garrett that year. But this is the first time I think the Bears are being put into a position of where, and it, it kind of goes to this last point at the side of the video here, is is Caleb Williams that generational franchise-changing quarterback? And we don't know that, but... Of all these quarterbacks in the draft uh, in this draft class, 
I think he has the best chance to be one, especially when you're coming into the situation he is with the Chicago Bears. Exactly that point. The last point is exactly the whole point. Like, he, like he let's let's not forget he's he's a rookie quarterback. He's going to make rookie mistakes. There's going to be stuff that people are going to go, oh no, why did he throw it there or why did he run or Where, what's that fumble? Oh my god, it's cost us the game. Is he going to cost us a game? He might do. Might not, might do. There might be an error that's there. But what I will say is, is that he doesn't have to win the game on his own. And for a rookie quarterback to go into any situation on a team and not have to worry about that part, part of it is massive because you just need to look at the impact and, and, and the impact. And if you want to look at Justin Fields as an example, the confident imp- impact that was done because of the scenario that he got to found himself in into almost was very difficult for him to get out of because it's 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 memory it's muscle memory it's suddenly memory of oh no my, my offensive line is going to fall apart or my wide receiver can't catch i'm not talking about just i'm talking about any quarterback a rookie quarterback suddenly it's panic mode and you're playing at top end sport where everyone you're playing with against knows what they're doing in in the vast majority of ways caleb is coming into a situation where i i, I loved it there was somebody talking about keelan allen and they're like, imagine having a rookie quarterback or they're going to a game where it's third and seven, it's in the fourth quarter and you get into the huddle and Keenan Allen just goes, just give me the ball. Just give me the ball. Don't worry about the clay and all this. Just find, I'm going to be there. Find, get, just get the ball to me. And and that's that's why, for me, getting, getting Caleb Williams into this situation is going to be real fun because he doesn't have to be the hero week one. And that's that's really, really good for the Chicago Bears going forward. Yeah, exactly. And look, obviously one of the main talking points that we had with Robert was about kind of this whole idea of Ryan Paul splitting up his front office into these teams, the wide receiver, offensive tackle, edge. And I really like it. Or let's just, not so much edge, but like pass rusher, right? Um, what I really like about that, and we mentioned it last week, is if they go offensive tackle, wide receiver, or one of these guys in the interior or mm. at the edge position, they're all coming into a team that not all the pressure is on straight away. Like, look, you let's say Ramadunze is the guy, right? And they think that he's excellent, all that sort of stuff. Well, like we just said, yeah, you've Keenan Allen to help to help you. You're helping the young quarterback, but also help your young receiver. But also the fact is, on those third downs, you could have Keenan Allen's like, give me the ball. DJ Moore's like, I'll get open. Give me the ball. And then there's a rookie that's coming in that on any other circumstance, you would be wanting them to be that like thousand yard receiver, which the funny thing is when you have a DJ Moore or a Keenan Allen, he doesn't have to be. And that's one of the beauties of this. Same thing for offensive tackle. If you pick Joe Alt or you pick Fashionu, like you're coming into a fairly steady offensive line other than that, because you still have guys like, Darnell Wright, you still have Tevin Jenkins, you have two veterans at the center position. You're hoping that Nate Davis will have a better year at right guard. And if he does, like you're going into a unit there where like it's it, there's consistency, and that's what I think is really good. And then also we talk about defense, right? The edge rusher. If you were picking an edge rusher top 10 and you didn't have Montez Sweat, think of the pressure that would have been on one of those young guys because they're going to like, you got to get between 10 and 50 and sacks coming into your rookie season, which is not easy to do when you're going to get double team. But now you have Montez sweat across from you. So that helps you out. The same thing is if you go for Byron Murphy, like you mentioned on earlier, like he's going to be lining up next to Montez sweat where he's going to get more pressure up the middle because an offensive line is worried about what Montez sweat's going to do on the outside. And, that's some of the really cool things here that I personally, when you when we say like wide receiver, offense, tackle, edge, like we might have our preference for a certain player, but I actually don't think you, you can be mad whatever way that they go if it's one of them because it's still improving the football team. And regardless, you, in this, when you have a top 10 pick in a draft class where you know there's probably four quarterbacks being taken in the top five, and then Marvin Harrison is the other guy. Like someone's falling to you that in most draft classes wouldn't. And that's that's the good thing here where the Bears can really catapult themselves 
into that conversation of even if it is for a wild card like the Texans did last year, but look at what the Texans are doing now. They have that rookie contract, and now they're going all in. They went for the pass rushers in free agency. They just traded for Stephon Diggs. It wouldn't shock me if the Bears do something similar, that if they just get into the playoffs and they lose in the playoffs and stuff, watch Ryan Poles push all of his chips in next year because he knows he has a he has the quarterback and he knows that he can build around it. And he has five years really here to open that Super Bowl window. And that's what makes this really exciting. And people should be excited. Stop worrying about everyone fighting on Twitter. Actually be excited for what the Bears are doing here. They have two top 10 picks here where if they hit on both of those guys, you're catapulting yourself into a team that can compete for the division every single year. And that's where we've always wanted to be. We started this podcast and talking about all the teams that are constantly getting two top 10 picks in the draft. And we were hoping that the bears would fix the quarterback and then start being able to get productive players in the first round. It looks like they could end up doing that this year. And, really change the fortunes of this franchise and stop this whole i've seen a lot of comments stop this whole ptsd that bears fans have with the quarterback and believe that this can actually get turned around this year because we have a gm that's making good decisions yeah i, I mean yeah it's 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 it should be fun it should be entertaining it should be it should be everything it should be a little bit of just Row the horses in. We're in a very, very good division as well. Don't forget that we've seen we've seen three other teams who are, who are improving as well. And but this is the best situation Bears fans should be in. Going, we got two two top ten picks, lads. I mean, who cares what else we do? Sorry, Tony. Totally exactly. look, look at it this way as well. Like this, 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 this draft and this off season isn't the the end of the building. You know, yeah. like the, the, we haven't reached that pinnacle yet. You know, next season is going to be huge as well. What you want to see is get your rookie QB in, get your top 10, whatever it is, alongside them, um, and and watch this team grow from what it was last year to hopefully get into a situation where you're winning double-digit games, you're heading, heading into the playoffs. You know, no, I don't think anyone's expecting the Bears to win the Super Bowl next year, um, and they shouldn't, uh, but they want to see the progress. And then what you want to do then is go into next offseason and say, right, we have now not only a solid defence, not only a really promising offense, uh, but we've got a franchise, potentially got a franchise quarterback here, um, and we can then go about adding like some really, really key pieces because uh, there's some there's some wide receivers that are coming out next year as well in the draft that are that are going to be really good options to take. And you remember when Mike Ditka first came to the Bears in '82 or whenever it was, and he said, "Give me three years, guys, and I'll get you to." I'll get you to the big game, okay? And some of you guys might not be here because you're not good enough. And some of you guys will be here because you are good enough. And that's the process that Ryan Poles is going through just now. He's identifying the needs. He's getting rid of the things that don't work. And it's a process that's not going to be done in just two years. It's going to take three, probably three off-seasons entirely um, before we start to see... Um, I was maybe going to the big game again uh, 40 years later, but um, yeah, we can only live in hope at this point. But I'm feeling optimistic about it. I think regardless of who we take at nine, we're going to get a good player. Um, I, I, yeah, exactly, man. Like, that's it. Like, there's nothing to be down about here. Like, no, it's we've, moved, great. we've moved on. We've moved on. The, Q, the QB conversation is over. We're now moving on and we're building from where we are. And exactly what you said there, like, and I'm, I, I've done, a, I did a bit of research, and I was, I was joking a little bit around, around the desperation around tree tech, but honestly, Murphy is I very, love it. He's very great. good. Like, and and people be like, oh no, Dunsey was there, or Bowers was there, or Alt was there, and they pick a different chick. I, I'm gonna be like, this kid can play, lads. And and again, same goes then if it was, I don't know, if they went and picked, even if they picked Bowers, you're like tight end at nine. He's not just a tight end. This kid is bonkersly good and all those things to have there's so many teams that would want the opportunity that we have right now and it, it, it's it's there for us if we if we if you want it and you got to get excited about it draft night come on to the Irish Bear show we do it live 
all day. We're here all the time. It gets unbelievably tiring. We thought this show at one forty nine was long. Trust me, the live show from the draft is even more insane, especially after nine when we don't have anything else for the Bears to talk about. But yeah, look, it's it's going to get exciting. It really is. Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned or, or when we were talking about the potential things that could happen in the draft and if let's just say the the receivers did go right and you end up getting there at nine someone's traded up i think if i was going defensive player i would want byron murphy over some of the edge rushers because i can see a scenario where byron murphy could become a legitimate three technique and be that kind of quote unquote kind of star defensive tackle in this league because he, he in terms of the physical tools are there the tape is there my biggest concern with the edge rushers is I don't see that with those guys. I see good players. I don't know if I see potential superstar and you kind of want to try and do that at nine. So I think if you're looking at, if alter one of those receivers are there, I think you probably run up to the podium and announce that pick. If they're all gone, I'd be all on board for a guy like Byron Murphy to come in here because I think that could be a game changer for the defense. But again, I think right now I'd focus on the offense. You're bringing in a young quarterback, build around him. You already have a really good defense and and see where we go. But look, guys, we really appreciate all you guys that have watched us today, watched us over the last three years. We really do not take it lightly. We We enjoy reading all your comments, even if we don't get to put them on the show all the time we do actually look at every single one of them and they do make us laugh we do talk about them as well and we do appreciate you guys kind of joining us for this we will obviously next week we will at least have uh one it might not we'll have one recorded video anyway because we will have some guys from uh usc and to be able to talk about caleb williams and some of their other draft prospects on the program we will have obviously our next live show next wednesday as well Please stay tuned for for that. We'll announce kind of what that video is going to entail in due course. But we will be talking about, obviously, Caleb Williams next week with one of the reporters from USC. So please do check that out. Um, Make sure that you follow us over on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. And look, we appreciate every single one of you guys. And until next time, all we can say is bear down. Bear down. Nice rack it up, rack it up, I got a bit of the bank to make me a safe house Shake it up, shake it up, she got her hands on her knees and she bringing a cake out Smoke it up, smoke it up, I got some gas, some packs, I'm up in the greenhouse Ball it up, ball it up, I'm with the gang, we taking shots off the rebound Fuckin' my pole